This is a Medicare for All educational program to provide current health care reform info for single payer health care reform campaigns in Massachusetts and nationally. Thanks to Mass Peace Action's Health Care Not Warfare campaign for all the wonderful technical help. Uh, our guest speaker uh, today is a renowned specialist in healthcare reform. Uh, Dr. Alan Myers has both an expert in healthcare reform and public health. He's been a leader at Boston Medical Center. Uh, he's a pediatrician and a professor at Boston University, as well as a healthcare advocate par excellence on statewide and national levels for many years. He is, in fact, a member of the board of Mass Care. That's the Mass Campaign for Single Payer uh, in Massachusetts, as well as being on the board of Physicians for National Health Programs. Um, and from there, I'll just let Alan take it away. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, so as you mentioned, um, uh, I do work with the sponsoring organization of this presentation, uh, Massachusetts Peace Actions Fund Healthcare Not Warfare Committee. And I also work with uh, allied organizations, Physicians for National Health Program, the Right Care Alliance, uh, and Mass Care, which is the coalition working to advance single payer uh, health care, health insurance in the state of Massachusetts, as well as the Democratic Socialists of America's Medicare for All Working Group. So let's start by acknowledging that the current pandemic of COVID-19 is shining a very harsh spotlight on the dysfunction of our healthcare system. Um, in fact, uh, there are data that suggests that up to one third of COVID-19 deaths and about 40% of infections are linked to a lack of health insurance. Uh, even if one has health insurance, if you are unlucky enough to become infected with COVID, get pneumonia from that infection and be admitted to the hospital, you can expect to pay over $1,300 cash out of pocket that your insurance won't cover. Uh, during the pandemic, there have been a lot of job, uh, of pandemic related job losses. It's estimated that about 6% of people who lost their jobs because of the pandemic also lost employer sponsored health insurance. Of that number, about two thirds found other sources of insurance, which left about one third of those folks or about 3 million people who lost coverage due to the pandemic. But that hasn't impeded the profits of the big for-profit health insurance corporations. Five of America's largest health insurers reported more than $11 billion in profits in the second quarter. That's because uh, fewer people were seeking care for elective procedures and staying away from health institutions because of the pandemic. And during this time, private insurers uh, while yes, they're covering out-of-pocket costs for testing and vaccines, they are now not waiving uh, treatment costs because there is no federal mandate requiring insurers to waive out-of-pocket treatment costs. And almost three quarters of the largest insurers in each state are no longer waiving these costs uh, for treatment for COVID-19. Uh, on top of that, there is a large for-profit hospital chain, Community Health Systems, which has begun suing their patients who cannot pay their medical bills um, mm. during the pandemic. 19,000 lawsuits um, brought by this wow. chain since the onset of the pandemic through mid-May, um, which of course can ruin people financially, even though community health systems had its most profitable year in at least a decade in 2020, even as it was suing patients during this pandemic. So that brings us to what we might consider the US healthcare paradox, that amongst all wealthy nations, we in the United States have the highest costs, the highest rate of uninsured and underinsured people and the poorest performance. So costs, uh, this green bar on top shows the per capita health spending in the United States in 2019, it was about $11,000. Um, that, uh, that is twice the average spent by 10 comparably wealthy nations Canada is spending less than half of what we do. That's shown here. Um, I would encourage you to fix this slide in your mind because we're gonna come back to the Canadian example. 
This difference in healthcare spending between us in the United States and other developed nations is only getting greater over time, as you can see here. Health insurance coverage. The most recent data from the Census Bureau for 2019 indicate that in that year, 8% of the population, over 26 million people, had no health insurance at any point during the year. In that year, at the time of the survey, 9.2% of the population, almost 30 million, were not covered by health insurance, and that's up by a million from the prior year. Now, we might ask, well, is it important that people have health insurance? And it sounds like a silly question. Of course it's important. But for questions like this, we like to look at the data, if there are data available. So here's a study. The authors isolated health insurance coverage from every other factor uh, a variable uh, that they could control for. And they found that simply not having insurance uh, was associated with a 16% increase in mortality just for not having insurance. So there is, if you will, a body count to the level of uninsurance in the United States. Performance. The Commonwealth Fund periodically issues this mirror mirror report, which compares performance uh, amongst the wealthy nations on healthcare delivery. The most recent report is from uh, the last month, uh, is from August of this year, 2021. Quote The United States ranks last overall, despite spending, spending far more of its GDP on healthcare. The US ranks last on access to care, administrative efficiency, equity, and healthcare outcomes. We can see this graphically here, where on the y-axis, we graph uh, healthcare performance among a variety of metrics. And on the x-axis, you see healthcare spending per capita. So here are the wealthy nations clustered in this area of the graph. We are the outlier by far. Another way of looking at this is to plot life expectancy in years on the y-axis here and per capita healthcare spending on the x-axis. Again, you see a relationship amongst all these other nations we are the outlier. We are doing something uniquely wrong in our delivery of health care to our population. So it is no surprise that half of adults reported putting off care in one year due to costs in the United States, that almost 18% of individuals in the United States are carrying medical debt at this point, worse for the poor than the rich, of course. GoFundMe reports that one third of all fundraisers are now for medical costs medical costs are now the leading category of GoFundMe fundraisers. So let's step back and look at the big picture of health insurance. So here we see that almost about half, 49% of everybody in the United States across the age spectrum relies on employer-based private health insurance. About 20% are covered by Medicaid, about 14% by Medicare. There's your 9% uninsured, 6% uh, have individually purchased policies, and about half of them are on the Affordable Care Act exchanges. Now, what are the problems with private health insurance? Number one, the administrative complexity of these multiple insurers adds expense to the entire system. And that's shown nicely in this graph, which shows that over the last 50 years, the growth in the number of physicians shown here in yellow is dwarfed by the growth in the administrative personnel shown here in the blue-green. This costs a lot of money. And private insurance's, healthcare's are, private insurance's costs are skyrocketing. Uh, that's represented by this blue line here, up over 52% uh, over 10 years compared to the growth in spending of Medicare, which is just over 21%, or Medicare just over 12%. Uh, another way to look at this is the fact that the difference in between what we're spending in the United States and what Canada is spending, almost half of that difference is accounted for solely by this uh, bureaucratic spending uh, that really doesn't get us anything. And Bloomberg Business Week put it very succinctly, the reason healthcare is so expensive, insurance companies. The arrangement that accounts for much of the difference between health spending in the US and other places is the enormous administrative overhead costs that come from lodging healthcare reimbursement in the hands of insurance companies. Thank you, Bloomberg. Secondly, high out-of-pocket costs with private health insurance, which have consequences for patients. So uh, this graph shows the growth in the cost of a family plan purchased by the average, by the uh, employer for the average worker is up, up over $20,500 in 2019, of which the average worker 
is paying over $6,000 out of their paycheck for that family plan. In Massachusetts, the employer premium contribution has gone up 276% over the last 18 years, um, compared to 50% of general price inflation and 86% rise in personal income. Uh, deductibles have almost quadrupled in, in the 12 years between 2006 and 2018. And if you're in a high deductible plan, which is true for almost 40, for over 40% of individuals, you can expect to spend over $4,500 cash out of pocket before your insurance plan pays a penny of your costs. So one example of how this plays out in the real world during the period 2016 to 2019, privately insured families paid about $3,000 out of pocket for a normal childbirth. That's insured people, what they have to pay out of pocket for normal childbirth. Does that make a difference in terms of people seeking care? Does it make people smarter shoppers? No, it doesn't. What happens is when you impose unbearable costs on patients, they stay away from care. They stay away from all kinds of care, preventive care, mental health, emergency department. And there is no evidence that uh, people uh, stay away from urgently needed care compared to care that may not be so necessary. It cuts it, 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 it cuts utilization across the board. Again, there is a body count to be had by imposing costs out of pocket on patients seeking care. There's another example, a study from February of this year that showed that an increase in just over $10 per prescription in certain medications was tied to an almost one third increase in mortality. Under insurance is the norm with private health insurance. If you focus on this orange slice of this graph, you can see that almost a quarter, 23% of those who are privately insured through the workplace are underinsured. What does that mean? It means they are spending 10% or more of their annual net income on out-of-pocket medical costs. That's in addition to the premiums that they're paying. So it is no surprise that over one third, 34%, of those with employer-based health, health insurance report that in the past year they had medical bill or medical debt problems um, with their employer-based health insurance. Half of private health insurance is for profit. What does that mean? It means that over $100 billion of our health spending is going directly into profits for investors. And where do those monies go? Well, a big chunk of it goes to support the CEO salaries of these enormous for-profit health insurance giants. We have to ask ourselves, is this where we wanna be spending our limited healthcare dollars? For-profit hospitals cost more, almost 20% in this study. And in terms of uh, uh, renal dialysis, death rates for for-profit dialysis clinics are 9% higher. Why is that? It's because you can't serve two masters. Your bottom line is either to maximize profits for your investors, or to optimize outcomes for the patients. You can't do both. And that's very clear in dialysis where an extra hour of dialysis treatment might extend the patient's life, but will cut into the profits of the investors. Finally, there's continual churn in the private health insurance world. In one study in Michigan, in one year, 28% of those covered uh, by employer-based health insurance changed plans, either because the worker changed their job status or the employer changed the plans that were available. But we hear people love their private health insurance. Oh, really? Um, well, we have some data that we can look at. Here's a study from this past June in the JAMA Network Open publication. In this survey, individuals with private insurance were more likely to report poor access to care, higher costs of care, and less satisfaction with care compared with individuals covered by publicly sponsored insurance programs. That's what the data tell us. So that brings us to Medicare for All, which has gotten a lot more exposure in the last few years, probably at least in part due to Bernie Sanders' 2016 uh, presidential campaign. The first point that we should make is that when we refer to Medicare for All, we do not mean expanding eligibility to the Medicare program as it is currently configured to cover all age ranges and not just seniors over age 65. That's not what we mean. Why do I say that? There are problems with Medicare as is. I can speak as a beneficiary here. 
Number one, it's not comprehensive. Part B covers only 80% of clinician and physician fees. So if you're gonna protect yourself uh, against financial ruin, it means you have to purchase additional insurance with money out of pocket. That makes it complicated. It makes it expensive because not only are you paying your premium for traditional Medicare, which is deducted from social security payments for me personally, that's about $150 a month, but one also has to buy the supplement and the Part D drug, uh, drug coverage plan. And it allows the for-profit insurance giants uh, to make money off of this nominally public program through the Medicare Advantage option. So when I enrolled in Medicare, uh, I was helpfully, I was sent this helpful uh, uh, email. This is lifted, uh, this is a screenshot from that email from Medicare. I was informed by Medicare that I could expect to spend 63, over $6,300 cash out of pocket for my traditional Medicare with my Medigap policy, that's my supplemental policy and the drug plan. And that's if I'm healthy. That's if I have no additional medical expenses beyond my, you know, my annual physical and screening tests. So it's no surprise that in one year, almost a quarter, 23% of US seniors citing costs didn't go to the doctor when they were sick, didn't fill a prescription or skip a dose, didn't get a recommended test or medical treatment. So when we talk about Medicare for all, we're talking about an improved Medicare for all, and that is synonymous with single payer. What do we mean by that? We mean that one payer, the government, either the national government in a national plan or the state government in a state plan, not insurance companies, pick up all the bills for medical care. That hospitals and nursing homes and other institutions are given global budgets to cover their costs in advance, just like the fire department, funded by public funds that the patient has a free choice of doctor, clinician, and hospital, uniform fee schedules for clinicians, price controls for drug companies. What the patient sees is no out-of-pocket costs and a free choice of clinician and hospital, very important. Now, this is essentially what Canada has achieved. This cartoon appeared in the Boston Globe uh, during the Clinton administration's uh, attempt at a healthcare reform gosh bill, if only there were a fair, efficient way to give everyone quality, affordable health care. Well, sadly, the Clinton administration, neither the Clinton administration nor the Obama administration looked to the Canadian example. But we can look. And if we do, what we can see is that Canada was spending almost exactly what we were spending up till the implementation of its single payer plan nationally, at which point you can see how the spending diverged between us in the USA and Canada. And their outcomes for a number of conditions are documented to be better than ours. So for example, this study showed that in 2011, the median age of cystic fibrosis patients survival was less than 37 years in the United States compared with greater than 48 years in Canada. This is an especially important uh, comparison because cystic fibrosis is a condition that is responsive to intensive medical management. So the current bill in the, our House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. to establish an improved Medicare for All national health insurance program is H.R. 1976. It was introduced this past March by Representative Pramila Jayapal uh, of Washington State. Uh, it is the latest iteration of the bill introduced in 2003 by John Dingell as H.R. at that time 676. It is now co-sponsored by just over half of House Democrats, which includes all of the Massachusetts delegation, except for representatives Lynch, Moulton, and Meal. The corresponding bill in the Senate in the last session was S1129. Uh, it's due to be reintroduced this fall by Bernie Sanders. It is only supported by about a third of Senate Democrats, but it does include both of Massachusetts Senators uh, Markey and Warren. Now, Single payer could also be implemented by a single state. After all, that's how it happened in Canada. Canada's single payer system began with Saskatchewan, which implemented single payer uh, hospital cost coverage in 1961. And it worked so well that other provinces followed suit and the system was nationalized in 1971. If that's going to happen in the United States, the states will have to get cooperation from the national government in Washington because federal funds such as through Medicare and Medicaid will have to be combined into the state program. And to do that, the states will need 
either a waiver issued by Health and Human Services or legislation. Now, Representative Ro Khanna, a Democrat of California, has introduced legislation to do exactly that. The current version is HR 3775, which was introduced in June of this year, the State-Based Universal Health Care Act of 2021. And uh, at present, the only Massachusetts representative uh, co-sponsoring this legislation is Representative Ayanna Presley. In the Massachusetts State House, the bills that would create a state-level single-payer system, Senate Bill 766, introduced by Senator Jamie Eldridge, and House Bill 1267, introduced by Representatives Denise Garlick and Lindsay Sabadosa. The single-payer bill would provide health care services to all residents of Massachusetts as a right, without any uh, co-insurance or other form of patient cost sharing to be administered by the Massachusetts Health Care Trust, funding hospitals and other facilities with operating budgets in advance and capital expenditures funded separately, very important, negotiated drug prices, and funds set aside for retraining workers and offering job placement services to those whose administrative uh, work is no longer needed in this streamlined system. Benefits to the residents, everyone is covered regardless of citizenship status, all residents of the state with a free choice of practitioner, all medically necessary, med ne medically necessary care covered, including rehabilitation, mental behavioral substance use services, reproductive health care, including abortion, long-term hospice care, dental care, vision, hearing, prescription drugs, and medical equipment. Funding will be through an employer uh, payroll tax of either seven and a half or 8%, depending on the size of the business, exempting the first $20,000, an, an employee payroll tax of two and a half percent, again with the exemption, a self-employed tax of 10%, tax on unearned income of 10%. Now, it's been calculated that the average worker who is currently spending over $3.30 an hour of their wages for their family plan coverage will, under this bill, now be spending 36 cents an hour for their coverage, and employers will be saving up to over $12,000 per employee uh, to fund this system. How is that possible, we might ask? Well, Professor Gerald Friedman uh, at UMass Hamhurst estimates that this act would save $34 billion in the first year alone. The public is already there. This Reuters Ipsos poll from uh, 2018 shows 70% uh, support across the board for Medicare for All. And in this poll, it included a majority of Republicans. Now, all polls aren't that optimistic, but they virtually all show majority support. This Kaiser tracking poll from October of last year showed 53% overall support for Medicare for All, including 77% of Democrats and 21% of Republicans. Physicians are already there. 56% support for single payer healthcare in this 2017 Mary Hawkins survey. Importantly, the American College of Physicians um, recommended single payer financing as the way to go uh, in January of 2020. This is the second largest organization of doctors, in this case, in specialists in internal medicine after the AMA. And in fact, no co-sponsor of Medicare for All has lost re-election in the past decade, even in Republican-leaning districts. So I think the way is forward is clear. Let's work on it. Thank you.